for us. So today, uh, I really love this passage of scripture that we're talking about that Coit just read in Joshua chapter 20, point, Joshua chapter 24. And um, as I approach this passage of scripture, I want to play a little game with you. And I want to ask you a couple questions. I want you to take a moment and think about, I think you've done this before. But we're going we're gonna to be intentional about it. I want you to take a moment and think about who's in your head at the end of the day. Like you, you go to the bed at the end of the day and everything's quiet and you can still hear the sounds of certain people's voices ringing in, in your ear. You can hear what they sound like. You can hear the, the sound of their laugh. You know what they laugh at. You know the, the words that they mispronounce. And you just hold your tongue and not correct all the mispronounced words that they say incorrectly. Um, I, I want you to take a minute to think about who these people are. I'm just going to give you a second, and I want you to just kind of list them out in your mind of who these individuals are. All right, you got them, okay? So now we're going to flip it. Now I want to ask you, who has your voice in their ear at the end of the day? At the end of the day, who hears the sound of your voice? Who hears the sound of your laugh? Who, he who has the sound of your mispronounced words? Ma you don't mispronounce any words, do you? <laughs> um, but I want you to think about the other side of it, but who, who hears the sound of your voice? Because when we think about this list of names, what we're really doing is we're collecting kind of a a network of people that we spend extravagant amounts of time with on a regular basis, people that we interact with most frequently. For the sake of what we're talking about today, I would like for you to consider these people your household. And the reason I say that is because household has changed over the course of the centuries. What we mean when we say household today is different than what we see household meaning in scripture. It's different than probably what household meant 100 years ago. And so understanding this, what this means is important. But when we think about the people who we know the sound of their voice and they know the sound of our voice, what we're really saying is these are the people who have influence on our lives and the people we have been given influence into their lives. And so as we look at Joshua chapter 24 today in just a few moments, this is all going to tie together for us to understand the significance of what Joshua is addressing in this, this, these final moments of the book of Joshua. Often we don't consider what we say to people. We often don't consider what we say around people. But yet these are the people that we influence most. And these are the ones whose lives we make a mark on, that we leave an impression on. When we think about these people, I want you to think about how you have intentionally or unintentionally left a mark on their lives. In many cases, these are the people that we interact with more than people in our, our own bio biological families. Some, like if we look at today in our culture, are you people we interact with workers or neighbors or people that you don't even really like being around that much more than you do your brothers and your sisters and or your kids or your grandparents you probably don't interact with these people as much as you do people who just happen to be in in the same rhythm of life as you are and so therefore what we mean when we say family dynamic what we mean when we say household actually looks a little bit different than it probably would have in the context of the scripture that we're reading so Joshua uses this language, and it has a profound meaning. And if we don't understand his context, then we actually lose out on the depth of what he's trying to say. So if you're unfamiliar, Moses, Moses has taken us through uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and he has brought the people of Israel, all the way from Egypt to the promised land. He can see the promised land, but yet he has not been given permission by God to enter the promised land. And so he appoints Joshua, his successor, to take the people into the promised land. And so that's, this is where we get the, the whole book of Joshua. And Joshua is tasked with the responsibility to go and take the land that God has promised Israel and to bring his people and create uh, a, a 
a network of communities for God's people, the millions of God's people that has, have exited Egypt through the promised land and have arrived at their new home. The thing I love about Joshua is that scary things don't seem to scare him. When you read through the context and the story of his life, scary things don't seem to bother him. He walks right up. He looks it in the eye and says, what do you want from me? What, what challenge do you pose to me? This is the and Joshua and Caleb and all the other spies. Uh, and all the other spies come back, and they're scared out of their minds. I think I have to switch out microphones, folks. So Joshua and Caleb come back, and they're like, what is the big deal with what everybody's freaking out about? I am not intimidated by this because the Lord is with me, and he is with us, and he is going to grant us the things that he has promised us. So uh, Joshua looks this intimidating moment in the face, and he doesn't, he doesn't flinch at all. And, and this is the, the person of Joshua that we see, and this is why God has appointed him to be the leader of God's people to succeed Moses and to complete the task at hand. When I think about my own life, and I think about the scary things that I've had to deal with, becoming a parent is pretty intimidating. Maddie says, my daughter says it's, it, she is, it is intimidating. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? Your siblings are. Okay. I get it. Um, starting a new job can be intimidating. Have you ever had a, have a hard conversation with a, a good friend, an honest conversation? That's pretty scary. There's a lot of instances where we encounter in life that are intimidating that can cause us to flinch. And so that's one thing I really admire about Joshua is that he just doesn't seem to get scared about things that are supposed to scare him and things that are probably are far more scary than anything that I've gone through. So, let's look at Joshua chapter 24, 14, 15, and let's kind of navigate through this passage of Scripture and, and hear what he has to say here. Joshua 4, 24, 14, 15 says, So, this is in response to, uh, th this is the end of this journey, and he said, Now that you have established a, a residency in this land, these are things that I want to present to you moving forward because you are going to be on your own. And this is what he says. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put forever the idols and your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But, verse 15, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today who you will serve. And then he kind of starts giving some options. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served but beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? Well, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And so he, I, I love what he's doing here because what he's saying is you have an option. You have a choice to make. I can't make the choice for you. I cannot make the decision on your behalf. I can, I can lead you to the promised land. I can establish residency. But how your life goes at this point moving forward is not my, on my responsibility. It is not on my watch. I will present to you the decision that God has given me, and you can make it for yourself. And this is contrary to what we often think. We often think that it's God's job to speak through the prophets to tell us what we're doing wrong so that we can do the right thing and we can just stay on the path and just take me, tell me where my next step is. And I, will, I will walk forward to my next step and I will do the next thing as long as God tells me exactly what to do explicitly, I will do it. But what Joshua is saying here is that I'm not going to tell you explicitly what to do. I'm going to give you the choice to make the decision for yourself. And this is a big deal. And this is something that we often don't realize that is our responsibility to do here and now in the world in which we live. We live in a culture where it's somewhat appropriate to go to church. It's somewhat appropriate to believe in God. It's somewhat appropriate to pray. It, th these are all normal occurrences. And if you grow up in a family that's Christian, if you grow up in a family that believes in God, then maybe this was just normal to you. But what Joshua is saying is that we are living abnormally in a people of, of other beliefs. And therefore, you have to decide what your normal is going to look like. What are you going to believe to be normal? And it, it is up to you to decide because other people are going to tell you that it's abnormal for you to believe in the, the living God. So, 
J Joshua says here in verse 15, as for me and my family, he's saying, I've already made the decision for myself. I already know how I'm going to live and how my family is going to live. And now it's up to you to decide what you and your family are going to do. Now, let's, uh, help, uh, let's try to see if we can understand Joshua's family dynamic a little bit here. How old was Joshua when he said this? 30, 40? No. He was probably 110 years old when this was written. About 110 years old. So, we don't know much about his family. It's not written. But let's just suppose for a second that he had four kids. And his four kids had four kids. And their four kids had four kids. And their four kids had four kids. And so on and so forth. Well, that means that he will probably have somewhere in the ballpark of 340 family members. So when he's talking about me and my family, he's talking about multiple generations that he has been granted authority over, not including hired servants, um, other kinds of people who work in his family, people that they've adopted in and included. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people that he has been given influence by God to oversee. We're talking, when he says family, we're not talking about the nuclear family of four to five people who live in a single family dwelling or an apartment complex. We're talking about a, a medium-sized village. Joshua is in charge of a medium-sized village. And so I can think of two somewhat modern examples in popular media that depict this concept. And the two examples are the Crowley family and the Corleone family. Do you know these families? You probably know one or the other. If you don't, okay, just full transparency, I've never seen Downton Abbey. I've never seen it. I don't, don't mean to offend, but I will not say the name of the individual who has given me insight to Downton Abbey because he would probably not want me to say that he's watched Downton Abbey. So all that being said, the whole the premise is it's basically two very similar families where you have a patriarch or a family leader who oversees a wide ex spread of individuals uh, who have influence in their community, who have a reputation, who have to decide this is the what our, what our family is going to stand for and how we will live. So you may not have associated these two with each other or with the Bible, but here you go. Now you get to. Next time you see an ad or a, a depiction of any of these, now you know this is like the book of Joshua. So I say all this to demonstrate the potential range of influence that every person in this room has. Every person in this room has the opportunity to have the same sort of influence that we see Joshua have, that we see the Corleones and the Crowley family possess as well. Maybe the Lord wants to give you that same sort of influence. Maybe he already has, and you just have not embraced it yet. Perhaps the Lord wants to, to, for you to be the example to 340-plus medium-sized village group of people so that you can portray what it means to be devoted to the one true God. The difference between these examples and what we're talking about is that you were called by God with a purpose. Those who hear your voice, they see something that's more than just social, more than just political. They see devotion. They see personal conviction for the love of God. When Joshua says, well, for me and for my family, what he's saying is, I have God as my highest level of influence. He's saying, I will not be swayed away based on what this world or any other influential voice might say to me or about me. So let me explain it this way. A concept that you're probably familiar with. There's, there's two different devices that are used when dealing with the temperature of a room. There's two different devices. One of them is a thermometer, and one of them is a thermostat. And they, to, to, they do similar things, but they serve different purposes. A thermometer's job is to indicate, to, to tell you what the temperature of the room is. That's the only job. You just walk around and say, what's the temperature of this room? You ever had an AC guy come to your house with a little, little ra uh, ultra, ultraviolet, uh, not ultraviolet, um, infrared gun? And he's shooting around and saying, this is how much this room, room temperature is. This is what this room's temperature is. Its only job is to tell you what it currently is. It's not to 
it's not expected to do anything else. A thermostat, on the other hand, its job is to tell the room what its temperature is supposed to be. There's two differences there. As God's people, we're in, our, our job is not simply to be a reflection of the temperature, of the atmosphere, of the environment. We are supposed to be the instructors of it. Our responsibility is to shape the world. And so this is w- the point I want to make in this. God's people were intended to shape the rest of the world. We shape it. We decide for ourselves what we believe and how we will live, and the world responds to us. We're, it's not our responsibility to adapt to the world around us. It's our responsibility to be so firm and so confident in what we believe because we have a higher influence who has shaped our lives that the whole world around us follow suit. They see who you are, they see what God's done in your life, and then they become a reflection of it, and they become a conforming around what they see to be true because of your devotion and your convictions that you live by. All right, so Joshua puts the responsibility of devotion on his people, and therefore he puts the responsibility of devotion on us. That we are given the responsibility to decide for ourselves. Our devotion isn't accidental. It's not convenient. It's decisive. It's intentional. It's purposeful. And when we accept responsibility for godly devotion, two things happen. Two things happen that I want to tell you about. The first thing is that we abandon our need to be accepted by others. The second thing is that we embrace the influence in our, we embrace the influence that we have on others' lives. So I want to talk about these two things for just a moment. The first, that we abandon our need to be accepted by others. When we abandon acceptance by other people, what we're, what's happening is our confidence is being born of the Holy Spirit's voice. No one else's voice can measure up to the voice of the Holy Spirit in our life. And so if that's the case, that means that the voice of the Holy Spirit supersedes any voice that we interact with, any voice that rings in our ear at the end of the day, any voice that we think that is necessary for our success. Well, I can't be successful unless so-and-so says this or does this or desires this for me. We cast all that off because we say the Holy Spirit's my provider. He is my authority, and he is my counselor, and he's the one who identifies me for who I am. And I don't need any other acceptance from anybody else. So then what we're doing is we're repositioning ourselves so that the Holy Spirit becomes the voice of authority over anybody else in our life that we might seek acceptance from. Confidence, motivation, courage, all of these things stem from a personal decision to trust God. The second thing that happens is when we embrace the influence we have in others' lives. Now, this is, this is uncomfortable for us at times. When we embrace the influence, devotion to God actually causes us to cherish others and to want them to know God as we do. It no longer becomes about what's going on in my own brain anymore, about what people think of me or what I desire or what I crave, but instead it repositions us to be able to see what others feel, what others think, what others desire, and what God says about them. Until we can get to this place where we are validated by the Holy Spirit and we are confirmed by Him, we are only looking at ourselves, craving acceptance for ourselves, and we will never be able to have the attitude that Joshua has because we haven't been validated by the Holy Spirit in His favor and His authority in our life. So compassion, understanding, hope, all of these things stem from a personal decision to trust God. And so here's the uncomfortable truth that concludes from these two points. It is impossible to positively influence someone while craving their acceptance. It is impossible. Let me explain what that means. It is impossible to po- positively influence someone while craving their acceptance. So, if I desire someone's acceptance, if I want to be wanted by them, if I want to be desired, then there's no way that I will ever be able to stand up for what I believe to be true or right or good in hopes that they would follow me because my whole purpose is to conform to their desires and attention to be accepted by them. So therefore, I have to lay down my desire to be accepted so that they would see that I'm going to stand firm in my convictions and crave what I want. Why would they want what I have 
Why would they want my devotion? Why would they want to, to have what God's provided for me if I'm willing to turn that in just to get them to smile at me, just to get them to, to, to give me praise, just to give me to, to, to say a compliment to me? I have to be willing to let those things go and to not be liked, to not be wanted, to not be accepted, knowing that my convictions ring more firm and more true and more important to me. And this is where Joshua's strength comes from. This is where his authority comes from. If there are people in your life who you want to know Jesus, then you have to let your standing with God be more important than your standing with them. I want you to think for a second about who those people might be. Maybe it's a boss or a coworker. Maybe it's a friendship that you want someone to, to care about you the way that you care about them, and so you're willing to accommodate. Maybe it's a spouse or a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Maybe it's your child. I see this happen all the time where people want their, their children to give them attention, to accept them, to not reject them, so they're willing to accommodate. And actually, the parent loses credibility because they have nothing to stand on because they're willing to cater and they're willing to yield to their children's needs and desires. So let me tell you why I love this passage and why it means so much to me. I spent a good chunk of my adolescence and early adulthood craving acceptance. I accommodated others to keep people in my life. I allowed my opinions to conform to the opinions of those around me because I felt like if I just thought the way they thought and wanted what they wanted, then, then we could be good friends and then I would be included. My attitude even would mirror those I spent a lot of time with. And so therefore, I grew frustrated and I grew aimless. It was empty and meaningless. It was awful. This passage was disruptive to me. It was uncomfortable because Joshua is so abnormal. He is so different than the way the rest of the world operates. I was confused and I was equally fascinated by how he operated. A man who didn't need to be liked, and yet he was at the same time liked very much. A man who made decisions without re needing the validation of others. So here you look at this. Joshua's statement pairs with God's grace, and what it did for me is it set me on a path to make my devotion my own. And there was freedom. For the first time, there was freedom because I'll tell you, needing acceptance and inclusion and validation from other people is bondage. It's bondage. And we try to get freed from bondage, but our bondage actually is self-caused in a lot of cases because we're ser searching in the wrong places. And so if not for God's disruption in this passage of Scripture, I would still be chasing acceptance today. I would still be searching for validation. As a result, I probably would never have married Allison because there's nothing attractive about, like a woman would never find attractive a man who has no conviction, who has nothing worth standing on. I wouldn't have kids. I would never have become a pastor. I would never have experienced the life that I've experienced, the joys that I've experienced because I was too, chasey, too busy chasing inclusion. So I wonder if any of you are personally living my old life. If you have some version, some similarity to the life that God has brought me out of. And I want you to consider what it might look like for you to listen to Joshua here. When he says, decide for yourself if you prefer to worship the way that the world worships or do you prefer to worship the way that God has called you to. There's a common life principle that you may have heard, and I, if you haven't, I'll explain it to you. And it's the statement that you are the average of the five people that you spend most time with. Have you heard this before? Has anybody even heard this statement before? Most of you have not. Or you just don't want to raise your hand because you're afraid that people are going to reject you, which I'm preaching about. <laughs> okay, so here's the statement. You are the average of the five people you most, most spend the most amount of time with. I think there's a lot of truth to it. However, I've got a, a couple objections to it, and I want you to hear my objections to it. Two reasons why I think that this is not 
hopefully the case. Certainly, the people you spend around, uh, uh, around time with, you're going to share values with, you're going to get ideas from. However, I don't like it because it suggests that we are a negative impact on the people that we want to be like. If we are the fi- average of the five people that we want that we spend the most amount of time with, that means if I want to be like Bo, because I think he's so great, that means that, that when I spend time with Bo, then he's actually penalized for spending time with me. And I don't think that's the point of, of what we're trying to say, and I think it's an oversimplification of where people are. We don't rank people. That's not what the point is. That's not how God thinks about it. So we can't think of it this way that, that well, I just want to spend time with people who have, have their life together because my life's a mess. Well, if that's the case, then they probably don't want to spend their time with you because they're following the same principle. So I don't like it for that reason. The second reason I don't like it is because what it means is we're mostly looking to others to find our standard. That if we're the average of the five people we spend the most amount of time with, it means that we don't know for ourselves how we should live and so that we have to use other people as an example to how we live. But that's contrary to what we see in Scripture. The truth is that our standard doesn't come from the five people we spend time with. It doesn't come from the five most seasoned people in our life, the five most experienced people in our life, the five people that we love the most. It doesn't come with any of those. The standard comes because Jesus has given us a standard. And not because he's saying, hey, you need to live up to this, but because he has given us the empowerment by his grace to live a way contrary to the rest of the world. Joshua didn't think this way, that he was the average of the five people. He decided where he would get his standard. He decided that he would be a godly influence on other people. So let me tell you what I I believe is God's opinion on this principle, the the five-person principle. I believe that God's opinion is that God's people have all they need to be who they hope to be. They have all that they need. They don't need the world to tell them that they have what it takes. They don't need the world to give them the resources to be successful. You don't need the people around you or the environment you live in for you to be what you want to be. If God has put a vision in your heart and a dream in your heart, if that is from the Holy Spirit, it's been birthed by the Holy Spirit, then you have everything you need. Jesus has made it possible, and this is why. This is how God's grace functions. So let me make sure we understand what we mean when we say God's grace. God's grace isn't only the overcoming our failures and our faults and our insecurities. It is also providing us with the courage and the strength and the empowerment to to become the thing that we lack. So that means if I am lacking something, I've I've created, if I've got sin in my life, or I've got fault in my life, or if I've I've insufficiencies in my life, God's grace doesn't simply mean that we don't have those things anymore. It means that we don't have those things anymore, and we have the virtues to replace them. That we have something to celebrate, something that can mobilize us to receive the dream and the vision that he's put in our heart to be successful. Joshua knew this. He knew that whatever fault, whatever misstep that he might have made, whatever sin he could have he could have committed, that those were already covered. That's a given. But what's what's even more is that God's spirit rest upon him. He knew the sound of the Lord's voice, and it gave him the assurance to know the decisions that he make were good and right and in line with the heart of the Father. So what does all this mean for us? What my hope would be is that the people of Lifeline would be a household. The people of Lifeline, in the midst of this massive community that we are part of and the cities that surround this church, that we would be a people of conviction, of determination, of certainty, not because of what I say about you, not not because of what you say about you, but because of what you know that God has to say about you, what he believes about you, how he has empowered you. I love how cocky Joshua is in this passage of scripture. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't care what you say. You do, you do what you think is best, and I hope that you make the right decision, but you're going to have no influence on me because I know what I stand for. That is a serious tone, and I will tell you, it is wildly attractive to the world that you live in. Everybody's desperate to influence everybody, but the uninfluenced are appealing. We come a firm foundation for the rest of the world to build on. 
And so we have to make a conscious decision that we are not going to allow accommodations in our life anymore. We're not going to crave the inclusion and acceptance of the world around us. When you think about these five people that, or five to ten to twenty people that hear, hear, hear their voices right now, if you, you could probably hear the sound of their voices because you spend so much time with them. Maybe the Lord has those voices in your life because you're supposed to be the influence. That your devotion is supposed to be an example to them. So that when, when Joshua says, for me and my house, when you say, for me and my house, for me and my family, you're thinking of these individuals. What will they see? What will they look at when they see me? What, what kind of devotion are they going to see in my life? So here's my challenge. You're going to get a challenge every week from me. Because if you're not getting challenged, then why do you come to church? Your responsi responsibility today is simple. To decide for yourself. Decide for yourself. If I can put it, I think I've got it up here. Choose today whom you will serve. I can highlight the words of our prophet today. Joshua. Choose today who you will serve. Who will you serve? Not who will we serve. No, not who should we serve or who ought we serve, but who will you serve? It's a conscious choice, and when we make a conscious choice, we make a decision that our life is going to look according to that decision, that the, the choices that we make, that the values that we hold to are going to be a reflection of that decision. And that means that whatever interesting comment is posted on Facebook or whatever new idea is shared in a movie or whatever your coworker seems to be into, that those things have to become subject to the words that the Lord has spoken to you. And in doing so, Jesus is elevated because Jesus is the reason that we are who we are. We are the representation of his grace. So Joshua, choose today whom, whom you will serve. This is your house. This is your family. This is your sphere of influence. And once you decide who you will serve, this is the next step. Determine who's in your house. Maybe you need to make, take a notebook out and you need to write the names down of the people who God has placed in your sphere of influence. People who you hear their voice and they hear yours. And then you begin to pray for them. Then you begin to speak intentionally with them when you see them at work or down the street or when you talk to them on the phone. And then you invite them into what you know to be true about God. Be deliberate about these voices in your life and what God wants to do because it is transformative for us that we can see them through his eyes, not through our own any longer. And so this is my challenge to you. Decide for yourself and then determine who's in your house. Decide for yourself who you will serve and then determine who is in your family, who is in that sphere that God has placed around you. And by doing so, we will be expanding the house of God across the earth. And that's what Jesus came to accomplish. Let's pray today. Lord, thank you for the work that you've done in my life. Thank you for the example that you've given us through Joshua, the confidence of what this looks like when we get to walk with you, Lord. Thank you that the world has no authority. The world that we live in, we don't need its acceptance. And we can lay it down at your feet because your grace is sufficient for us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you give us the confidence that we desire to have don't think possible. God, I ask that these men and women, representatives of your kingdom, would go with boldness as Joshua. God, I pray that you would speak to them, that the, the voices that they hear this week, that they can't not think that you have a part in their life. Bless them, Lord. Amen. I've asked Jesse just to sing uh, for us. She's going to lead us in one more song of worship. So I'd like to invite you to stand.
And we can close in worship today.